Okay, so welcome to tonight's uh, faculty lecture uh, by uh, Professor uh, Richard Goddard uh, of History and Archaeology. And the title of this talk is Archaeological Research at Fort Massachusetts. Welcome okay. to Goddard. Thank you. Well, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> you want to go ahead and hit the light, thanks. Um, and we're still trying to figure out what it really looked like. This particular lithograph uh, was produced fairly early in the short life of the fort and was, uh, was published. Uh, so far, it's pretty good. It's not exactly what it looked like, but sort of what it looked like. The landscape, on the other hand, does not look like that. Okay. The war with Mexico was 1846-1847. It was finally settled with the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo in 1848, and this territory became part of the United States. Up until that time, this was part of Mexico. Okay. Soon thereafter, the U.S. government in, uh, decided to place um, forts in this newly acquired area for a variety of reasons. And they, in 1851, they built Fort Union in northern New Mexico, down near Las Vegas, New Mexico. And uh, the next year, in 1852, the Commandant of Fort Union, Colonel Edwin Summers, uh, Sumner, uh, appointed Major George Blake to come up into the San Luis Valley and build a fort. Um, the purpose of the fort was basically to control Ute raids on the local Hispanic communities in the valley. Major Blake came up in 1852 and started building Fort Massachusetts. Why it's called Fort Massachusetts, we've never been able to verify for sure, although it was probably a political move on the part of Blake because Sumner's, Sumner was from Massachusetts. That's the only connection we can find anything in Massachusetts, so he named it after his commanding officer's uh, home state. Uh, the fort was occupied only for five years. Uh, the, the, about a year or two into its uh, uh, life, it went through its first general inspection. Uh, an officer by the name of Mansfield came up and inspected it and said, this is a horrible fort. Why on earth would you put it here? And immediately started plans to move it. Uh, in 1858, the fort moved uh, six miles due south and was renamed Fort Garland. So Fort Massachusetts is six miles up Ute Creek Canyon north of Fort Garland. Okay, if you go to the site today, this is what you're going to see. There's nothing above ground left. But, in the mind's eye of an archaeologist, this is what we see. Okay. In a lot of people's minds, archaeology is about finding lost sites, and to a degree that's true. This site's been very cooperative because it's managed to get lost three times. Um, there, uh, from the best information we can get, there was actually standing remnants of Fort Massachusetts up until the turn of the century, and somewhere around 
uh, the beginning of the 20th century, a wildfire went through the area and leveled whatever was remaining of it. And it soon became lost. Uh, another problem is that people couldn't find it because all the historical records said that Fort Massachusetts is situated on the west bank of Ute Creek. Today it's on the east bank of Ute Creek. I'll explain how that happened a little bit. Um, and so by the early 20th century, nobody quite knew for sure, at least it would know, there was no documentation of where the fort existed. Uh, there were a few people who knew where it was. Photographer O.T. Davis, who fortunately for local historians, loved to go out and photograph important historic sites, and he did. And uh, in the 1920s, he took this photograph of the site, and there's clearly nothing left standing. But he did find it and photograph it, but most people didn't think it was all that important, and it got lost again. In the 1960s, uh, Galen Baker, an archaeologist working for Trinidad State Junior College, uh, was on a mission to find a lot of these early forts and document their location. And he did. He came out and did some excavations. And on this aerial photograph, he uh, marked out what he thought was the boundaries of Fort Massachusetts, and he's pretty close on it. Um, and he did three seasons of excavations to actually verify for sure that he had found Fort Massachusetts, and he had. Uh, he published a short article in 1965 in the Colorado Magazine. Unfortunately, a few years later, he died. And his notes have gone missing. And it got lost again. So, uh, I had known of the existence of the fort, so in 2009, my neighbor Doug Blake and myself decided to go find Fort Massachusetts uh, with the permission and the help of Trinchera Ranch. And they even provided us a ranch hand to guide us to the site. And he drove us right to the spot, except it wasn't the right spot. He didn't know where it was either. He thought he did. So we wandered around all afternoon, and towards the end of the afternoon, we literally stumbled into Fort Massachusetts. We fell into a hole that was been left from the previous excavations. So, in, the, in 2010, uh, in 2009, I'd finished up my archaeological work at Fort, Ma at Fort Garland. And so we were looking for a new site, and so my staff and myself uh, came out in 2010 and uh, spent two weeks uh, surveying what we thought was a site, digging some test pits to see, and we were, found plenty of artifacts and some remnants. So we were pretty sure we were on the right location, we just didn't know exactly where in the right location we were. Um, in 2011, I began a full-fledged archaeological field school uh, at the site, and again in 2012. I might note that there is, other than myself, there's four people in this room who were part of those digs. Um, this is a model of Fort Massachusetts. It's based on the only known map that was ever made. It was made during that inspection by Colonel Mansfield. Um, the scale, the vertical scale, is a little bit off on this because if, if the vertical scale was made proportional to the horizontal scale, it would be virtually impossible to make it. So it's, it doesn't stand that high relative to its um, width and length. Okay. I'm going to bore you for a couple minutes here with a story um, that I'm going to read. The story actually makes a very important point about what we're doing out there. 
I entitled the story, A Tale of Two Artifacts. It had been a particularly successful field season at Fort Massachusetts, and the site had begun to yield up the kinds of data we were looking for. Then, in the last days, about the middle of one particularly hot afternoon, at the point when I was beginning to look forward to returning to the field camp, cleaning up and relaxing, visitors arrived. Don't get me wrong, I look forward to visitors, although I must admit, I prefer them a little earlier in the day. Nevertheless, I stopped what I was doing and went over to greet them, and the greeting was followed by a summary of Fort Massachusetts, its history and its importance. Then it happened. The dreaded question was asked. What is the most exciting thing you have found? Answering this question meant that I was going to have to delay my anticipated return to camp. If I took the question literally, the answer could have been simple, but experience has shown that it would not be the answer they were hoping for. The problem arises from a misunderstanding in the general public about what archaeology is and why we pursue it. In their minds, Archaeology is an adventure in search of spectacular lost civilizations. <clears throat> the popularity of Indiana Jones tales has only reinforced this perception. So here I stood debating whether to tell them about the things that truly excite an archaeologist, with an attendant explanation of why these things are important or simply show them some far less important discovery that fit their preconceptions. <clears throat> Ultimately, I chose to do what I usually do. <coughs> I did both. I just had to resolve to get back to camp a whole lot later. James Dietz, one of the brilliant minds that helped establish American historical archaeology as a valid academic endeavor, was famous for describing much of what went on in the field as a very expensive way of learning what we already knew. What he was reacting to were archaeologists who spend enormous efforts to go out and find what history has already documented. There is a place for this kind of activity, but only if it leads to a deeper understanding that history did not give us. Simply finding Fort Massachusetts or documenting that it was made of logs and adobe and it had a palisade wall all the way around it would have been the kind of activity Dietz was criticizing. We already knew these things from historical documents and sketches and we would not have learned anything new. Yet these are the kinds of things the public finds exciting. To actually be able to see and touch things from the past intrigues the human mind. They help us establish our own place in time. If truth be told, most archaeologists never completely lose that sense of excitement when an artifact sees the light of day for the first time in hundreds or thousands of years. Yes, we all like the Indiana Jones movies. Nevertheless, true archaeologists learn to crave something more. We want to understand the past in its own terms. We want to know about the mundane details of how people live their lives, how they survived, what caused them to suffer? What gave them joy? And how they saw their world in ways that are different from our own views. History is very important, but it is the product of historians. Historical archaeologists are not, first and foremost, historians. We're anthropologists. History takes the broad picture analyzing the social, political, and economic trends of the past and examining how they influence events. James Dietz described what historical archaeologists do as history from the bottom up. We start with the simplest, most mundane things, what Dietz described as small things forgotten. And we attempt to reconstruct the lives and motivations of the individuals who participated in the same events that historians have documented. So, exactly how did I answer my visitors? Well, I started by taking them to see the remnants of the fort we had uncovered so far, the east wall, the laundress quarters, the barracks. These things played right into their pre, uh, preconception. Yes, we had truly discovered the location of 
the lost Fort Massachusetts. However, even though the fort's exact location was unknown, we clearly knew that it had existed, and we knew that it contained these features, so in Dietz's words, we learned what we already knew. Then I took the opportunity to help the visitors begin to see the deeper importance of this site by telling them about two simple artifacts that would be exciting to an archaeologist, a sardine can and a glue bottle. The sardine can was found amongst the ruins of an officer's quarters. The badly rusted can could be spe specifically identified because it had a brass label identifying the processor. Defes Anne, the contents, sardines, and the country of origin, France. Sardines were very popular food for the upper class in the 19th century. Canned sardines were not cheap, especially those imported from France. Even more amazing was the fact that these were consumed at a frontier fort where simple survival was something of a challenge. They certainly would have been an important status symbol. Western novels and movies have given us an image of the frontier forts as outposts of men ready to fight and defend settlers from Indian attacks. Historical documents do little to dispel this image. However, digging deeper, both in documents and the ground, reveals that there were a number of women and even some children at these outposts. And most of their lives were not spent fighting, but simply trying to live comfortably by Victorian standards. Officers and their wives, in particular, saw themselves as part of an upper middle class or an upper class. Did the officer who inhabited these quarters have a wife? Was the consumption of imported canned sardines for a special social event, perhaps entertaining the other officers and their families? How had they been obtained? Had the person brought them to this outpost? Were they mailed all the way from St. Louis? Or did the sutler, the merchant who had a store outside the main gate, stock them because he knew officers and their wives would buy them. Fragments of a small bottle were found in a fireplace in a barracks room. It's currently identified as a glue bottle, probably having originally contained Spalding's prepared glue. In the 1850s, glue was an important household product. It was used to repair broken furniture, build new furniture, repair damage to worn clothing and shoes, assemble scrapbooks, and a host of other things. In these days of cheap, readily available products, it is easy to lose sight of the fact of the make-do aspect of 19th century life, especially on the frontier. Most glues of the period were products that you made yourself by obtaining the materials and then heating and mixing them. They had to be prepared each time you needed them, and it was a bothersome task. Spalding's glue was different. It was more like the glues we take for granted today. You simply opened the bottle, applied some of the glue, and let it set up. It was truly a modern convenience. When we think of soldiers living in a fort, we tend to think uh, that they only concern themselves with military things. However, like anyone else on the frontier, they spent most of their time just trying to live their lives as comfortably and conveniently as possible. They had just as many needs for glue as anyone else. So, back to the story of my visitors. After showing them the remains of the rediscovered fort and answering their questions, I began to explain about the little things that are so important to archaeologists. The glue bottles and sardine cans that were things of individual lives now forgotten. I tried to let them see my excitement about these things with which we can begin to reconstruct a true picture of life at this remote spot so long ago. When possible, I let them touch the things and begin to wonder for themselves what living here was all about. They leave thanking me for my time and for what I have learned or what they have learned. For me, it was time well spent. I finally did return to the field camp a little later than I had planned, but satisfied. Okay, for the rest of my presentation, it'll be much more informal, and feel free to interrupt with questions uh, about any of these slides, or if at the end you need me to go back, I'm happy to do that. Okay. This is probably the first time that a flag has flown over 
Fort Massachusetts in 154 years. And that flag is pretty close to where the flagpole probably was set up. A little bit about the field school. 2011-2012 uh, excavations were funded largely by Lewis Bacon, the landowner, through the Moore Charitable Foundation. Research through a field school uh, is an interesting balance between education and pure research. In 2011-2012, we had 15 students from colleges and universities all over the United States. Roughly half of them were from Adams State and the other half from elsewhere. In some of the earlier years, uh, with the field school at Fort Garland, we have actually had students from overseas as well. Uh, we operate with a staff of five, uh, several technical consultants, and up to five volunteers at any point in time. Yes, you can volunteer and come out here. Okay, so, of course, where we're located, we have a field camp. And um, it's a few hundred yards from the site. Uh, most people live in small tents or trailers. They prepare their own food. We supply a mess tent, uh, which does have a stove and a refrigerator. Fortunately, as you'll see behind the mess tent, there's a power line that runs right over where we're camped. And the ranch was gracious enough to put in a power drop for us so that we can have lights in that tent at night if we want to have lectures and we can run refrigerators to keep perishable food uh, cold. We use a modified utility trailer as our lab and basic field headquarters. Student housing. <laughs> the first year we, a necessary thing was porta potties. Everybody hated the porta potties. This last year, the ranch went out of their way and they installed a septic system and built us two lovely outhouses. <laughs> With flush toilets, I might add. Since Ute Creek runs right past the camp, got to have a swimming hole. <coughs> And students built a swimming hole uh, with the permission of the ranch, and then we removed it at the end of the season. We'll put it back in next year. Uh, and even though this is snow melt, it's ice cold. At the end of a really hot, dusty day, it's great. Okay. The goal is to get the students to interpret what they're finding, not the way they would interpret those things today, but the way they would have been interpreted by people at the time. And so we have a, a program involved with getting them to begin to understand the lifestyle of the period. And it involves a variety of things. Uh, Basically things that would be common to a soldier at Fort Massachusetts. So, before excavation every morning, they stand formation on the parade ground at Fort Massachusetts. And we raise the flag and fire a cannon. By the way, firing the cannon became one of the most fun things of the <laughs> field school for most of the students. They loved it. So, we have a flag ceremony. But I also bring in uh, a number of historical reenactors, and these are men and women who have studied this period of time, uh, in many cases for decades, and they really know the material culture and the lifestyle of the period. And 
So they come in at various times and talk to the students about their knowledge. The students get to try firing weapons of the period. Uh, they, um, some of the students who are also in my reenacting group here, and so they, you know, they have uniforms and they'll show up in their uniforms. Uh, this gentleman on the right here is one of the ones that comes up, and he loves to do it. He comes up every year and talks to the students. And he even holds a period correct 19th century dance for them, where all the dance numbers are what would have been correct in the 1850s. Um, it tends to be a heck of a lot of fun, really. But, first and foremost, the work is about doing the archaeology. <laughs> Surprise! <laughs> uh, and we teach, uh, whenever, we, whenever it's appropriate to what we're doing, we teach the, the most modern techniques of recording data and uh, using computers and GIS to analyze that material, as you'll see here in a little bit. Uh, the, the students work in crews of about five. Uh, each crew will then have one of the staff members the staff members are almost always graduate students in archaeology uh, who come specifically to work on this. Um, the gentleman at the left is the uh, crew leader for this. This last year in 2012, he was my field director. And we use all the standard techniques that archaeologists have used for a very long time. And they learn the importance of recording everything in journals and filling out paperwork and the various techniques of digging. We do provide one little uh, luxury, and that is shade. Uh, it gets pretty hot out there. And uh, so we have some of these portable canvas carports that we set up, and it provides enough shade to make it livable. Here is the only known map of Fort Massachusetts. Uh, let me point out from the beginning, for reasons I cannot figure out, because this was made by a trained engineer, north is at the bottom. <laughs> I'll be using this map a number of times, and every other time you see it in this presentation, I will have reversed it somewhat north is at the top. But, I'll give you a real quick idea of what, what we have here. This is the main gate of Fort Massachusetts. That show up on there? Yeah, okay. This would be called the parade ground. This along the back is the officer's row. There were five separate quarters for officers. Um, there was a hospital over here and some general purpose buildings here. There is a line of barracks here and a line of barracks here. This line of barracks was for dragoons. This line of barracks was for infantry. Uh, dragoons were still being used in 1850s in the U.S. Army. In 1858, when the, this post was abandoned and they moved down to Fort Garland, there were not dragoons in the U.S. Army any longer. There was cavalry. Dragoons are sometimes described as uh, mounted infantry. If you were in the dragoons, you got on your horse, you rode to the battle, you got off your horse and you fought. If you were cavalry, you rode to the battle and you stayed on your horse until somebody shot you. Uh, and so they had a, a company, uh, they were able to have a full company of dragoons and a full company of infantry. Not that they ever had a full company of either there, but so, if they had had a full company of each, they would have had 200 troopers. Uh, don't think they ever really reached that number from what we've seen in the historical records. 
Uh, this uh, over here is sort of general purpose. This we're pretty sure is the, uh, the mess hall. Uh, we've got some other general purpose rooms. Uh, there's a blacksmith shop over here. There is a bakery over here. And there's this little interesting line of rooms here. There were eight rooms reserved for post laundresses. At this period of time, the Army hired women to do laundry and mending for the soldiers. They would be provided a room on the post. They would be provided their firewood, half of their rations, and they would be uh, the, uh, any soldier who wished to have his laundry done then had a certain amount taken out of his pay every month and paid to the laundress. A laundress would do better than a private in the Army did. But the interesting thing is, when you read about the frontier forts, these women are invisible. They're not there at all. At least you never hear about them. Partially because these were working class women. They didn't fit the Victorian model very well. But they were there. Professor, were they, yes. were they local women, do you think? Or were they women that were shipped here from the East Coast or thereabouts? Both. Uh, uh, they would hire local women if they were interested in the job. Otherwise, they would bring women from back East. Uh, and it was a good paying job. You could make a living doing it. Many of the women were eventually married to the non-commissioned officers, the NCOs, the sergeants and the corporals at the post. But that wasn't a requirement. And one of the reenactors that comes out and talks to the students has spent about 30 years studying laundresses. And she arrives with all this equipment that a laundress would have. And it's not a very attractive job. I'll come back to say a little bit more about laundresses. OK. So there is also a corral. The dragoons had to have horses also. They kept cattle and sheep here for food purposes. They would be kept in this area over here. And then up here is another thing you don't normally run into information on, the sutler store. When the Army would build a post, it would build a sutler store, and then it would contract with a merchant to uh, operate that store and carry all the supplies that the Army did not issue to people, but that people would need or want like a bottle of glue. And uh, they also set some limits on what the sutler could or could not supply. Not that the sutlers paid much attention to that. But um, that was the sutler store. There was a sutler store at Fort Garland as well. Uh, so it was a very common phenomenon. OK, now, remember, this is east off to this side, off to the left. That's Ute Creek when the fort was built right up through there. This over here is a little drainage. Just a little runoff channel. No, you didn't have water in it at all. Today, this is a little drainage, and this is Ute Creek. Which raises all sorts of questions about how to get over there. If the creek had migrated, it would have pretty much wiped out the fort or at least the archaeological evidence of the fort, and it hasn't. It appears that one day it just quit running in one channel and started running down the other. Now we have reason to believe that's exactly what happened. And we know the culprit. That. The gold dredge. This last summer we were studying a number of really strange features on the creek upstream <coughs> from the fort and realized this thing has been dredged. And doing a little bit of research, this machine was running 
up by the town of Russell, if you know where that is, up on uh, 160 as you're going up towards La Vida Pass. And there was a, a gold deposit there known as Officer's Bar. And this machine dredged that. Now, if you've never seen one of these things work, it's a little hard, especially you're going to get that in a creek. Yep. Because what you do, you build the thing, you haul it into pieces, you build it right on top of the creek, and then you build a dam behind it, and a pond develops, and the thing floats. Then you drive it forward to the upper end of the pond, and you start working, and this thing digs away the soil at the upper end of the pond, hauls it into the machine, processes it for gold, and dumps it out the back under your dam. And so basically, you just drive it up the creek and it takes a pond with it. And it moves up the creek. If there's any water at all, you can run one of these things, as strange as it seems. And inside it, it is a complete gold mill. By the way, Ute Creek, where Fort Massachusetts sits, is just on the other side of that ridge. We haven't been able to prove yet that this dredge was the one that was used. Circumstantial evidence says this dredge was the one that was used. Uh, but we're doing some research which I think eventually will prove that that's what they did with the thing. So anyhow, it moved the creek, basically. But there's something else interesting we noticed. If they had dredged the creek right up past Fort Massachusetts, they would have destroyed half of the fort, and they didn't touch it. We don't know if someone told them not to, or out of their own sense of historical importance, they chose not to. They dredged right up to the fort, and then they moved it around, and then went dredging from the, the other side. And in the process, we're pretty sure that's when the creek changed course. Whatever reason, I'm darn glad that they didn't destroy the fort. Okay. In 2011, uh, our approach for the six weeks of the field school was, number one, to identify the fort compound. Uh, number two, to identify features within that compound. Uh, and basically, we would put the corrals and sutler store off for a different year, which we're still waiting to get around to. So, how do we find the compound? Well, let me back up here for a second. We knew roughly where it was, but we couldn't say this is exactly where this fort sat. So, our approach was we were going to dig trenches across where we thought the east, south, and north walls were. At that point, we thought the west wall was gone due to the creek. Um, so we set out first to dig a trench right across this wall, the east wall. And shortly thereafter, one across the south wall and one across the north wall. Well, that was the plan. Okay, quickly, on the east wall, we encountered this. Those are the bases of rotted off posts. That is the east wall. And we hit that within a few days, which that doesn't usually happen. It also gave us an orientation. The wall was lined up on magnetic north where magnetic north was in 1852. Unfortunately, we didn't have quite the same luck with the north and south walls. Documents tell us that the north, east, and west wall were what call, are called picket walls. That's where you set the posts into the ground vertically, side by side. Your typical John Wayne killed the Indians fort. But for reasons that was very strange, the documents seem to suggest the south wall of the fort used horizontal logs. Horizontal logs are not a good way to build a fort. 
If you build a wall with horizontal logs, it doesn't take much to push the whole thing over. So we're trying to figure out why did they build the south wall that way. That would be the front wall. Um, as we worked on the south wall, we didn't find any logs at all or anything else. A little bit of some building materials, but we never found the south wall, which meant that it might have been scavenged when they moved down to Fort Garland. They may have hauled some of the logs out of the south wall and taken them down because the first buildings of Fort Garland were built out of wood. Um, or the archaeologist Galen Baker in the 60s may have removed them entirely. We know he did some work in that area, and, but we could find nothing of the south wall. It didn't help that we didn't have any dimensions for the fort. This is kind of puzzling because anybody who graduates from West Point uh, is an engineer. West Point's an engineering school. Colonel Mansfield, who drew that map when he did his inspection, was an engineer. Highly detailed map, didn't bother to put any dimensions on it and no scale. So we know what the fort looks like, we had no idea how big it was. Galen Baker, who worked there in the 60s, said, it's 270 feet from east to west and 320 feet north to south, but never bothered to explain how he came up with those numbers. One of the documents that has given us a lot more information is this. It's a sketch that was made of the fort when it was occupied. By the way, the people I was talking to about trees earlier, there they are again. This sketch was made by a man, DeWitt Peters. He was the post surgeon and a pretty good sketch artist. And he's put in a lot of detail, including the horizontal walls, the logs in the south wall. Uh, so uh, we at least have that to work with. Dumb luck. <laughs> we just go looking everywhere there might be records. And I do have, one of my staff members is just one of the most talented historical researchers I've ever known. She just seems to have a nose for knowing right where to go find things. And she found this in a manuscript someplace. And turns out she also has many of the letters. DeWitt Peters wrote a lot of letters about life at the fort to his family back east. And so uh, we uh, were very fortunate to have that. Okay. We did not have much better luck on the North Wall. Okay. I'll explain what some of these are here in a little bit. But this was the original trench we started with, and here's the East Wall. So remember, this is now reversed with North at the top. Uh, and we hit the East Wall and said, oh, this is going to be a piece of cake. That was the only easy thing that came out. Then we started a trench down here. And again, the trenches are so long because we have no idea where the wall is for sure. So we figured we'll just keep digging until we hit the wall. Well, they kept digging and there was no wall. So we went up to the north side. And by the way, this is, an, this is superimposed on an aerial photograph of the site today. And yes, there is this road that runs right through it. It goes right out through the main gate. Uh, by the way, the ranch closed that road this year so that the site wouldn't be damaged anymore. They've been extremely helpful in this project. So I put one of the crews working to find the North Wall. He started here and dug for a while. Actually, he started here and dug this direction south and didn't find it. So he started here and dug this direction north and didn't find it. And this footprint of the fort is not necessarily accurate. It's our best guess from 2011 as to where the fort matters. Uh, we ended up doing uh, some more testing here and did find structural remains, which I'll show you here in a few minutes, of the laundress quarters. The lower logs of the walls are still in place. <coughs> and we did a little test over here and ran smack into a fire hearth, a fireplace, uh, that would have been in one of the barracks. 
that's where the glue, glue bottle came from, by the way, right there. The, uh, uh, the sardine can came from up here. So, I want to tell you about the story of the North Wall. It took us two years to resolve this. So, as I said, the approach is to dig a narrow trench and just keep going until you hit the wall. And there, this is a narrow trench they started, and they're in the officer's area, and there's a piece of bone sticking out of the side wall, and there was a bunch of other artifacts, not a lot, but a few scattered throughout the trench, so we knew we were in the right area, but no wall. By the time they got done, this isn't going to be real easy to see, they had started the trench here and dug all this. It's been filled back in in this picture. All the way down here. No wall. So, left a little bridge about 12 to 14 inches wide of dirt here to get across it. Started the trench here and went No wall. So, we were sure that one end of the trench was inside the fort and one end of the trench was outside the fort, but there wasn't any wall. So, we were left to try to ponder this one. Had it been previously excavated by Galen Baker and destroyed in the process? One possibility, it's a small one, but it happens in archaeology, they had gates in the back wall. Just by the luck of the draw, we may have placed our trench right smack through the gate. Or, uh, had the wood been removed? The um, staff member that I had given this task to, um, Brandon Reynolds, it's a good sport, it's a good thing. Because by the end of the dig, Brandon was getting pretty dejected. He had artifacts and no wall. He really wanted to find that wall. Brandon is particularly interested in uh, learning about the lives of officers. And so uh, he needed to know what was inside the wall, what was outside the wall, because inside the wall was going to be the officers' quarters, and we did not know. And uh, So, the end of the season, no north wall. So, we knew an east wall, but we still couldn't establish the north or south boundaries of the fort. Well, I'm glad to say that in 2012, we found the north wall. He moved slightly to the east of where he had been digging, and there it was. There is the line of posts. He had been digging off to the left of the screen here, and here was the line of posts. So he was one very happy camper. He now had the north wall. But that still raises the question, why didn't you get it last year? Remember that little bridge I told you about? <laughs> that one foot wide piece of strip, that's the north wall. We do not ever intend to let Brandon forget this. <laughs> but that happens in archaeology quite often. Most archaeologists been in the field very long have stories like that. Oops, I'm going the wrong way there. Oh, got the wrong one. That's why. Okay, but Brandon did at the south end of his trench run into these beams, which in fact we're pretty sure are the support beams of the officer's cabin. And that is where he found the sardine can, down along those beams. Uh, eventually we were going to return and do much more detailed work in that area now that we have a better sense of where we are. Okay. These were the foundation logs from the laundress quarters. 
And now that we know where the laundress quarters is, we can begin to study the life of laundresses, <coughs> hopefully. The documents and the sketches both suggest that parts of the building were built with buildings were built with picket walls, straight up and down logs, and other parts were built with horizontal logs. Horizontal logs are a little easier to build with because you don't have to dig a trench to stand them in, but like I say, they don't they're not as strong for an exterior wall. The laundress quarter seems to have had been butted right up against the exterior eastern wall of the fort. So their outer wall was vertical posts and all the rest of the structure was horizontal. Doesn't look like much, but that's the beginnings of the fireplace where we found, uh, uh, found the glue bottle. These are adobe blo bro blocks here and here. And I have a much better picture of this that in 2012, we went back and really cleaned this up and fully excavated it. And it's, uh, I'll have that here for you in a minute. Okay. Interesting thing is adobe was used for fireplaces. Uh, they did not try to build them out of rock. Okay. So, there we got the Mansfield map again. And... This is the basic compound. It looks exactly like a textbook example of what a fort's supposed to look like. At least if you study at West Point. Uh, it has a wall all the way around it. It has bastions that stick out on three corners. The reason for these are that if you're attacked, you can, with inside the protection of the bastion, you can shoot down the length of any wall uh, to defend your fort. This one over, this one down here was used as a blacksmith shop. This one was used as a bakery. And this is a feature you would always have in forts. It's called a blockhouse. If you have a well inside the fort, that's where it is. And that's where you keep your supplies, because if your fort is attacked and you're being overrun, that's your last defense. You, go, you retire to the blockhouse. Okay. So it looks like they were following the building practices that were taught at West Point. It's primarily built out of logs. Uh, and adobe fireplaces, that was an adjustment to the local environment. Typical forts would have earthworks all around them as defensive structures. This one doesn't, which was a bit of a puzzle. Uh, forts were almost always set up with this rectangular layout with infantry towards one side, cavalry or dragoons towards the other, officers along one side. Centrally located parade ground, medical facilities, the hospital down here, laundress apartments right along there. Um, so it's pretty, nothing too remarkable about the design of the fort, except the lack of earthworks and there's very little rock work. Okay. We're still puzzled, even though we never found the south wall, we knew the trench had gone through it somewhere. And we solved the puzzle about why they laid the logs horizontally on the south side. As soon as you dig down about six inches, you hit a layer of giant boulders. It's a whole lot easier to lay them horizontal on top of the boulders, which, in order to give the, that wall strength, they then attached all of these rooms here to that wall, so that the wall had horizontal strength. Um, another thing I want to point out, we haven't seen this in other forts. There is this walkway, this open walkway, between the laundress quarters 
and the barracks. We don't know if it was covered. We're not sure if it was open to the sky. And you have the same type of feature over here between the barracks and the general purpose rooms over here. So uh, we're still working on what exactly those were all about. Okay. The other thing we, so 2011, found the laundress quarters, found the east wall, did not find the north wall, found something up here, did not find anything down here. And we did, just out of curiosity, do some trenching and we extended one of the trenches outside the east wall. We found more artifacts outside the east wall than we found inside the east wall. Uh, we found a collection of buttons. Uh, we found a number of pipes. We had both civilian buttons and uniform buttons. Uh, and it suddenly dawned on us why. That's where the laundresses did their work. These were pretty confined little quarters, except in the wintertime you didn't want to be working in those. So the laundresses would come out of the fort and work over here, and it's the perfect place. You're protected from the wind because you're on the east side of the wall. You're only uh, 100 feet or less from a nice supply of water. Uh, and so the laundresses probably came out here to work, and so did the off-duty soldiers, just to hang out with the laundresses. One of the things you learn if you're in the military and you're on a fort, you don't hang out in the parade ground. This is where everything's supposed to be very, very formal. So you get out of the parade ground as quick as you can and get outside the walls. And so we're pretty sure that's why we were getting so many artifacts over in this area. Okay, so that was 2011. 2012, I allowed each of the staff members, now that we had a rough idea where we were, I allowed them to pick their own areas go with what their interests were, and take a team and go work. So, um, Brandon, as I mentioned, went back and worked in the area of the uh, north wall. Now he knew where it was and he found the wall very quickly and started working in the officer's area. And he's very interested in continuing to do research on how the lives of officers were different than um, enlisted men. And he's completed his master's thesis this last year on that very subject. And he's coming back this next summer to continue doing work on that towards a PhD. But as a reward for all of his failures, um, we gave him another area he was very interested in. We really wanted to know if that blockhouse was still there. And so we sent him up to the northwest corner and told him, dig another trench. This time, within a day or two, he hit the blockhouse. The blockhouse apparently fell over and these are the wall logs laying here of the blockhouse. And at the end of the season, we actually dug a hole through those logs, and there appears to be floor planks underneath them. So, we're going to be back working on the blockhouse for a lot of time, I think. That may hold a lot of interesting information for us. Okay, another one of my staff, Jamie Devine, uh, has developed an interest and is doing her graduate work on women and children in frontier forts. Uh, she's already published one paper on toys from Fort Garland. It's amazing how many toys we found at Fort Garland. So she's continuing to, um, uh, to work on the subjects of women and children at the forts. By the way, the title of her master's thesis will be It Takes a Fort. And so she started this long trench. At the far end of the trench, she's into the laundress quarters. At this end of the trench, well, actually right about here, she's in the barracks. 
And so between the two is that walkway or whatever it is between the, those buildings. We're still not entirely sure, but she exposed a great deal of it. And um, this, I think I have a better picture of it. Yes, I do. Uh, of a far. This is that hearth where the bottle was found. You can begin to see the adobe blocks. I have a better picture of a hearth on the other side that I'll show you. But, um, and then she worked out this way, and at a certain point, there's bits and pieces of wood from the structures, and then we're just probably outside the barracks building entirely at this point. But she's going to be working mostly in this area uh, for, time to, for some time to come. So that's along that east side. Uh, my field supervisor, Delphin Weiss, uh, went to the opposite side to work in the Dragoon Barracks. There's a couple places where you could actually see a fire hearth eroding from the ground, and so that's where he started. And this right here is an adobe fireplace. The adobe takes on this reddish-orange color when it's heated a lot. And so it was really very obvious very quickly that we had a fireplace there. And here he's inside the barracks. He's excavated down through the floor here. Um, found a lot of ammunition scattered all over in this, this room. Okay, well, I'm happy to say in 2012, we also found the south wall. In a minute, I'll show you where this, this is on a map. Uh, the young lady, who Amanda Sivnar, who worked on the south wall in 2011, was now determined she was going to find a wall, too. And so she went to work looking for the south wall. And on another section of the south wall, she found this, which turns out to be an adobe fireplace, and this pile of rocks, and you'll notice there is this absolutely straight side along the pile of rocks, and it lines up perfectly with the straight side of the fireplace, and sure enough, there was remnants of a beam in there. And later, we were actually able to determine that Galen Baker had excavated this same area. That's why a lot of it was missing. And we cleared the land outside, and there's nothing outside that beam. So we're 95% confident we know where the south wall is now. And so, uh, okay, now let's see if I can work this magic, if I can even see where the keys are. Yep, zip, 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 yeah, hit the wrong button, okay. Ooh, whoop, well, there it is, that's what I wanted. Okay, this is a GIS map that has been assembled. Uh, the red lines indicate the outer walls of the structures that we know of at, uh, at Fort Massachusetts. And the areas in blue were the areas that were excavated in 2011. The areas in green are the ones we excavated in 2012. And if you look, do I have a cursor on here? Yes, there it is. Somewhere. Where'd it go? You can't see it. Oh, well, wonderful. But you'll notice this blue trench up here has a little tiny gap in it right on top of the north wall. <laughs> <laughs> I think I'm going to frame that for dinner. <laughs> and then you'll notice to the east of it, to the right of it, there is the green areas where we did, in fact, find the north wall. Um, this is the area, uh, the green area down here on the Uh, this side, this is where Jamie put her trenches from laundress quarters to the barracks. This is where we looked for the south wall and found it, just to the side of the gate. We just off the modern road today. Started here, found building remnants, worked the way this way, and bingo, there was the wall. So we got that. This was that hearth over in the Dragoon area. We're not quite sure which building we're in there. And then way up there at the corner is the blockhouse. Okay. 
Uh, one other little thing, if I can make this work again. That light is wonderful for reading, but it doesn't help at all here. Oop. Did the wrong thing again. Yeah. How is it doing? Huh? How do I get to it again? Here's my uh, technical consultant. You get to the one with the. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay, you often hear about remote sensing in archaeology, and usually it's done with very expensive, fancy equipment like ground penetrating radar and uh, geomagnetism and voodoo and whatever else you can get your hands on. Uh, sometimes you don't need to do it with very sophisticated, well, not highly sophisticated equipment. Since we had a total station out there for surveying, we could. Uh, survey the surface of the land, a surface you can't even see because the grass and sagebrush is there, but we could actually go around and take, I don't know how many shots we took over there? About 1,800. In this area of gray here. And then he turned it on in gray, and because, and he has it basically so that higher areas come up lighter and lower areas come up darker. Notice this right here? That's a building. Guess where we're going to work next year? <laughs> <laughs> okay, now how am I going to get back to my, is it going to be still running or I'm going to be checked out of it? There we are. So, okay, so up to this point, what I've described is doing exactly what Dietz didn't like. A very expensive way to learn what we already knew. There was a fort there, and it had walls and buildings. But that's a starting point. Until you know where you're at, you can't go on to the more sophisticated questions. And we have started going on to the more sophisticated questions. And we hope each year to get more and more into questions about how did the people live? What did they think? What was their life like? Okay. Okay. Lots of buttons. Especially if you wash clothes on a scrub board, buttons come off. One of the interesting things about the military buttons, if you're a dragoon, your uniform buttons have a little D in the middle of them. If you're infantry, they have a little I in the middle of them. So we could verify, yes, they really had dragoons there. One of the things that makes Fort Massachusetts important is in the 1850s, after the end of the Mexican War, the army started to change everything. As I've already mentioned, they got rid of dragoons. They went entirely with cavalry. Uh, they started going to different uniforms. They started experimenting with different firearms. Uh, they started uh, changing a lot of their design and tactics of their bases. And nobody wrote much of it down. And Fort Massachusetts falls right into that period when the change was going on. And so it gives us a chance to document some of what the Army was going through at that time. Okay. We haven't had a chance yet to work up a statistical model about the frequency of the kind of buttons we're getting, but eventually we will do that. Okay. 
what you see there is a pistol ball, lead ball, uh, that came out of, uh, I'm not sure which side, which section that came out of. I think that was over in the Dragoon barracks. As I said, new firearms were being tried out. The Army was trying to advance its technology. And during the Mexican War, flintlocks were still being used by many of the troops. Uh, after the Mexican War, they got rid of all the flintlocks, went to cap locks, uh, percussion caps. Um, we have not found any evidence of flintlocks or flints at, uh, at the fort. But most of their rifles after the, or most of their weapons after the uh, Mexican War were smoothbore weapons. Not very accurate after a few yards. Rifles were not, had not become the popular kind of weapon, which are very accurate at long ranges. So the Army had adopted a special kind of load they'd actually been using it since the American Revolution that was particularly designed to increase your chances of hitting an enemy with a smooth bore musket. It's called buck and ball. You actually, it was all packaged in a little paper cartridge, and you bit off one end of the cartridge and poured the powder down the barrel, and then you bit off the other end and you poured a ball and three pieces of buckshot down the barrel. When you fired it, it went boom, like that. It hit something. <laughs> we have found an inordinate amount of buckshot. They were using buck and ball loads. In 2012, we actually found a piece, uh, a musket ball, three pieces of buckshot, and a little bit of paper of the paper cartridge. The whole cartridge had fallen through the floor. And so, we are able to document that. Um, but also the Army was beginning to experiment with rifled weapons. And with a rifled weapon, they quickly learned a round ball is not the best kind of projectile. A conical projectile is. And they went to something called the Manet ball, which is actually a conical bullet. We find those there. We have also found a piece of a cannon shell. These actually once were conical Manet balls after they hit the ground. Look like a cow pie. Anyhow, uh, what was really interesting is we found these just outside at the base of the wall, embedded in the ground. Two projectiles that were flying towards the fort when they hit the ground. There was never a battle fought at Fort Massachusetts. So what's with these? Here's one of the places where the reenactors come in really handy. We showed them to them and they understood exactly how these came to be. And they started beginning to tell us some of this daily lore of military life that you would never pick up anywhere else. In the period, if you were on sentry duty, you were expected to have a loaded weapon. You loaded your rifle when you went on sentry duty. When you got off of sentry duty, you had to unload your rifle. Now, and these lot rifles were not modern cartridge rifles. To load a rifle that time, you set it on the ground, you tear off the end of the paper cartridge, you poured paper down, or you poured the powder down there, and then you took the mini ball, you shoved it in the muzzle, and you rammed it down with a ramrod to get it down there. Unloading it is not going to be even that easy. It was not fun, it was kind of dangerous to unload them. But at the end of sentry duty, you had to come in with an unloaded weapon. What did you do? Boom! Go on in. <laughs> Another little piece of information that we hadn't expected to stumble on, but we did. A lot of the soldiers didn't even want to bother to do that. 
So you'd go over to a laundress, hand her the rifle, give her a couple of coins, and say, here, unload it and clean it for me. And the laundress would take it out and fire it, and clean it, and give it back. Some of the laundresses were dead shots, because they had more practice than the soldiers did. <laughs> Another thing we found in the way of ammunition at the fort is 4570 cartridge cases. The 4570 cartridge was the first cartridge ever used by the U.S. Army. They started issuing them in 1873, 20 years after the fort, and we find a bunch of them out there. It suddenly became very obvious, and again, the historical records don't document this. They didn't abandon Fort Massachusetts. When they went down to Fort Garland, they maintained it as an outpost, and they would have a few soldiers posted up there. And later, we did finally find in the document some one reference to being posted up at Fort, Fort Massachusetts. So, uh, again, little tiny bits of the story are beginning to uh, come out. One of the things, uh, my uh, field director is uh, becoming a specialist in bone, and he's analyzed, or in the process of analyzing, what kinds of animal bones are we finding in the trash dumps? How much were the animals, the, the, you know, the cattle that they brought along, how much are wild animals they were hunting to augment their uh, the supply? Uh, and so we're beginning to get a clearer picture of what their diet was like. Um, sardine can has to do with the diet. Uh, and so that's going to be one of the questions we're continuing to ask is um, what was life like there? Because one of the things we do know in one winter they had a really bad outbreak of scurvy at the post. So the diet wasn't as good as it should have been. Okay. Um, once again, the laundress quarters, the invisible women of history, except sometimes they are visible. That's Mary Clark and her child. Mary Clark was a laundress. Mary Clark was a laundress at Fort Massachusetts. She married one of the NCOs, or I'm not clear if she married him after she got to the fort, but uh, and she went on to, you know, raise a family. But she was there. This is when historical archaeology really becomes a, at a personal level, where suddenly you're looking face to face at the people who left the stuff that you're studying. And uh, that's always uh, an in interesting and intriguing aspect of One of the things we found outside the walls of the laundress quarters is a silver ring. Somebody lost a ring. It had some kind of stamped in decorations on it, uh, but, and Delphin has done a number of studies on the laundresses and jewelry and so on that they would have, would have had. Another thing we found was a table knife. We also, in the same area, as I said, found a half a dozen or so smoking pipes, clay smoking pipes, and inside the walls, in one of the laundress quarters, we found a small piece that we're not 100% certain yet, but it seems to be part of an opium pipe. Opium was legal at the time. And particularly amongst the working class, really hard-working people often turn to opium 
uh, to as a as a relief. So, for the one of the laundresses smoking opium, perhaps. supposed to be there. Okay. A couple other things that we're pondering. Everywhere we excavate any depth at all, we find a little ways down in the soil a sand layer. This is the, the rest of the soil is a silt, but we find this sand layer almost everywhere. Galen Baker, when he worked here in the 60s, came to the conclusion that that sand was hauled in and spread around on the parade ground uh, so when during rainstorms it wouldn't get so mucky and muddy. If you've ever walked across wet silt, you know what that's like. Uh, and that might be what it is, but we're beginning where we're finding it and the way we're finding it, we're beginning to suspect that isn't the explanation. Our current thought on it is that they had to plaster those walls. When they put up the post, they had to chink between the posts. And they had to plaster a lot of their walls. And we're thinking that this is the eroded plaster, a sand plaster that has eroded down, because we tend to find it thicker near walls and thinner as it spreads out. But we haven't tested enough areas yet to, to really test that hypothesis, but it's going to be one of the ones that we look at. Okay, some of our long-term research interests. Um, we're looking at what kind of an impact the fort had on the environment here. I mean, they cut down thousands of trees to build that thing, and uh, between building it and firewood. And uh, so we're looking at the environmental impact of that fort and how the environment has recovered. We actually think we may have actually found some of the tree stumps where they cut the trees down. So that's one of our research interests is to see the relationship of the fort. And another one of our, by the way, of our, this is just kind of an interesting thing is People had to have died in that five years. We don't know where they put them. We've been looking for the cemetery for a couple of years and still have not found it. Uh, one of the major questions is, okay, it goes back to something I said early on. Why the heck did Major Blake put the fort there? He was sent up here to control Ute Indian raids and to build a fort to do that. And he put it here. Environmentally, that was a disaster. 150 years ago, this was a lot wetter area. And the people complained about the damp wetlands, except in the summertime when they complained about the clouds of mosquitoes. Uh, we haven't had that problem when we've been up there, so it's a lot drier now. But that it was wet, and it was miserable, it was bitter cold in the wintertime. Uh, it sets in a Ute Creek runs straight north from Fort Garland, and this is at a point where the hills kind of pinch in, and so there's not a very large flat area. What was this man thinking? Well, I've got a couple working hypotheses. Number one is he put it smack on top of the only road into the San Luis Valley from the north and the road most heavily used by the Indians. Comes through Sangre de Cristo Pass, jumps over the ridge, and comes right down there. That two-track is still on the original road. Um, well, back east, if you want to control human traffic in an area, particularly in the 18th and 19th century, you control the roads because the forests were so dense that you just simply could not move people very effectively through the forest. They had to move on the roads. Everybody used the roads. My thinking is, he was thinking 
eastern fork. So I plunked it right smack on a road. The only thing is, in the west, that doesn't work. The Indians just walk around it and keep going. Oops. Um, another thing, I think, was a consideration. He knew that he would have to be, they have to come somewhere down there because he had this narrow pinch point. That seems to make sense. Also, he had to feed horses all year. There's a ton of natural grass that grows in this area. We also have evidences that they started trying to garden and grow some of their own food, not too successfully. Um, and so I think uh, that was probably one of, of uh, uh, his conclusions, or one of his, his reasons. Um, and also, I suspect, I've got to do some research on where um, uh, where he was stationed before he came out here. My guess is it was back east. If you've been out to Fort Garland, that's a pretty stark environment. Here I think he said, okay, I understand this. Trees, water, grass, hills, I know how to deal with this. You get out in the valley and like, what? There's nothing here. <laughs> uh, so I think he was probably thinking, uh, that Major Blake was thinking in terms of, okay, here's what I know about building forts. Also, I think he realized, who am I building a fort against? Ute Indians. Ute Indians don't attack forts. I'm not worried about attack. It's a very small possibility. And there are features built into the fort that when you look really closely at them, don't make much sense in terms of defensive design. But it looks like they were built for comfort. So uh, those are some of the uh, things we are, are looking at. After six weeks of work, we closed down the field school for the season. And it's always sort of an interesting experience. Most of the students have become quite close over six weeks. They have begun to experience what the soldiers and the civilians would have experienced. Living out in the elements, having to make do, try to be comfortable, and that you have to work together. Uh, they basically become a community. And a lot of them, usually the ones that complain for six weeks, suddenly don't want to leave. Because it's a very unique experience. Um, and many of them come back. The, uh, so well, we do several little things towards the end, fun things to try to uh, recognize this. And one of the things that's become very, very popular, usually on one of the last nights that we're out there, um, we do what we call the night fire and load and fire the cannon after dark. It's pretty darn spectacular. By the way, the rest of the year that cannon sits in my driveway. I get along really well with my neighbors. <laughs> that cannon, by the way, is a reproduction version of a mountain howitzer, which was one of the most commonly used cannons in the West. Okay. So, conclusions, I just want to say we are very grateful to the Moore Foundation for uh, providing uh, much of our funding for the last two years. We consider the 2011-2012 field school to have been highly successful. Uh, we are now moving, as I said, more and more into the little things of life in these places and beginning to understand things that aren't in the history books. Um, basically, the field school and the research has met or exceeded all of our expectations. And the site seems to have high potential for continuing to do that. And we expect to be there for quite a few years, all the variables permitting.